And welcome to One More Thing Podcast. Today I'm with uh, Pastor Larry Bauckham. Hey, and it's good to see you today. I've been uh, traveling for a while, and I came back and uh, sat in on the sermon, uh, the teaching this weekend. But I've watched all of the the four in the series, Fearless. Yeah. And just, I uh, you know, take my hat off and say, well done. Thanks. That's the kind of scholarship, the kind of uh, teaching that we like at Suncoast. It's one mm. of the, when I watch it, I'm proud of you. I just go, man, that's, uh, I'm proud of the way you communicate. I'm proud of the theological structure behind that, the way you handle it academically. I think it's just it's stellar, and uh, so I've got all good things to say. So if people don't do not like what you <laughs> have to say, then I have to say, then come and talk to me. <laughs> so, that means uh, but a lot. academically, you know, it's you were spot on. So let me uh, ask a couple of questions that sure. give you a chance to elaborate a little bit more on that. But this week we talked about hell, mm-hmm. and uh, in your conversation about hell, you used you alluded to this comment that. Uh, there was no concept of the afterlife in the Old Testament. Elaborate on that a little bit for me, will you? Yeah. You, I, when, when you look at the Old Testament, at least from my understanding, my, my, again, my academic upbringing, the Jews were, the Hebrews were not obsessed with any sort of afterlife as it pertained to reward or punishment. And it just seems to me like if, if that's the upbringing Jesus was was brought up in, then he too w- w- would not be obsessed with any reward or punishment sort of moral afterlife. So I did some lots of research and study, again, to sharpen the skills and my knowledge on that. And the only thing I saw was like references to Sheol, mm-hmm. which was the grave, like, right. the, like the physical, literal grave in which we're placed in. And everybody went there, whether you were just or unjust, wicked or good. And that was their only belief. And their understanding really of like eternal life was almost like generational, like continue this life through your offspring. Which is the Abrahamic covenant. That's exactly it, mm-hmm. is, is continue this life. And even that really obscure verse in Daniel chapter 12, where it talks about that, you know, They'll be in the grave shield, but some will go to everlasting life, some to everlasting contempt. Mm. And that says nothing of burning forever or having to face torment or punishment. It, I think it confirms like you're passing on the kind of person you are to the next generation. Right. So everlasting life, which is that, that blessing or everlasting contempt, like are your children going to follow in your footsteps of being wicked? A jerk, and that's how you'll your family line will be remembered. So and me, I think we all know people like that. Like their families are either known to be really good families, or nah, nah, we don't want to associate with them. And I think that's where the Old Testament laid out. One of the interesting stories in the Old Testament, Abraham. You know that Abraham was promised, you know, land, and you're going to be a blessing to the world. But you're going to have descendants as many as the stars in the sky. Mm-hmm. And the promise of eternal life is those descendants. Yes. I love to tell the story. This can't do this on Sunday, but hey, this is not Sunday. That's right. So people want to hear this. But Abraham, uh, at one point, wanted to send you know his servant off to get a wife for his son Isaac, and he brought him into his his meeting, and he says, "Look, I'm gonna I'm gonna send you off, but before you do, I'm gonna make you take a vow, you know, that you're gonna find the right wife for my son." And the, the older virgin said, "So he put his hand under his thigh." What really happened, and this I love this because it's just um, it's a little graphic, but he really put his hand on his testicles. That's right. And you know, testicles and make a test of, testify, testa. That's exactly you this, right. And you you make this vow and this oath, and what he was really saying: all my future descendants are in your hands. Now make swear to me a vow that you're going to protect what's in your hands by finding a wife for my son. Uh, and I think that is part of the concept of afterlife. And you handle that masterfully. And uh, somewhere in the intertestamental period, there were some other things that kind of filtrated right. in, you know, about, you know. Second temple period. Yes, yeah. and that whole thing. But that came much later. But in the in the Old Testament, you, I, I would say to that statement, there was no concept of this heaven or hell yes. as we hear today in evangelical Christianity. That's not in the Old Testament at all. Not at all. Yeah. And it, you see that in the, that intertestamental period, you know, what we say between Malachi and Matthew, right? Yeah. You know, that blank page in our Bible, 
that's when Hellenistic culture, the Greek culture, the Roman culture really influenced a lot of Judaism. And they took on much of their theology, you know, regarding the gods. And But you see it in Genesis 1, too. Like, how could you not have Egyptian ideas of creationism? Right. In, in influence the story that is told in in the first chapter of Genesis. It's deeply Egyptian, yeah. but you would expect that, you yeah. know. And one of the things I I went to Egypt once once upon a time, and uh, traveling down to those temples, to where the early Christians AD seventy, mm. when they were kicked out of Jerusalem. We're not going to the Hamas today, but they're kicked out of Jerusalem. Israel was in AD seventy, never to appear back as their homeland until nineteen forty eight. Mm-hmm. So just to let you know, it's a long time that. It wasn't your homeland. That's right. And that's where these other people lived, including those called Palestinians. But, that's right. But they went south, and they, the early church, when I went in these temples, I saw these, because they were vacant, they weren't, were, but the influence of the Egyptian temples on early Christianity with pictures of, uh, of a goddess with the, who had a baby, and she was a virgin. Oh, wow. And this baby, she's nursing this baby, and they have a halo over their head, much like wow. the Renaissance art. And you see these pictures, and you go, this strongly influenced early Christianity, as did the concept of, of uh, afterlife in Egyptian afterlife. So, you know, there's a balance and a scale. That's right. And your sins have to be as light as this feather, or you'll never be able to live in the afterlife. And uh, so in the New Testament, you have all the... The idea of not uh, Sheol, but Hades, Hades is the word that comes through. But uh, but this whole concept of heaven and hell, if there is some afterlife, some of it's been influenced by Egyptian culture. That's amazing, yeah. But not by ancient Hebrew culture. That's right. So uh, when we went to school, and I'm sure was, you know, there's a Hebrew way of thought versus the the dualistic Greek thought. That's right. It's totally different. Absolutely. But you know, to go back to the oldest, this uh, Hebrew way of thought, I think uh, there is no concept yeah. of of eternal punishment there is no concept of of eternal life that's right so we get to the new testament and we find uh, life is a very much a theme but then again there's a lot of egyptian influence there about life and afterlife that's right but today i i, I find it easy to give up on eternal damnation but what yeah. i find it difficult to give up on is there something more in the afterlife for me mm-hmm. Does that makes sense so it's Absolutely. okay to I'm okay to let hell go. Yes. But I, I, I don't think either one of us are let, willing to let go that there is something beyond beyond yeah. to where our spirit merges with the spirit of God that's all around us. That's that same spirit of, of Christ Yes, that still dwells, the Logos. That's right. Uh, that I think could take us on. But, but when you laid that out so well this weekend, I mean, I thought, you had your professor hat on. You went logic step one, step yeah. two, step three. And I just thought, masterfully done. I Thank mean, you. Thank you. well done. And then I went back a few weeks and saw some of the other stuff that you've, you know, that you've taught and how this series of Fearless is taking people out of uh, traditional thoughts and challenging them. Yeah. Why would you want to challenge it? I mean, yeah, it's like, it's a tough question. I'm I'm in no way like trying to be rebellious against God. Like, I'm get emotional. Like I love God with yeah. all of my heart. With all of my heart, I try my best to follow Jesus every day. And it's my deepest desire to see others do that. And I see all of these obstacles, all of these obstacles that have been man-made, that have been forged by fear. Mm-hmm. And not by faithfulness. Right. And it's like God just commanded me, like through my own, you know, through through my education. That's the way God works, right? right. God influ- he, he nug- nudges us along. And now I'm using what I've been equipped with to, to set people free because that's what truth does. I said it Sunday. Truth will either offend me or free me. Right. And it doesn't free me to live this this life of license to just do whatever I want to be wicked and know that I don't go to hell. Like the, right. it, it has never crossed my mind to do those sorts of things that I've let go of that concept of eternal damnation, but it has freed me to love unconditionally, to share this love, to spread this love. And that's why I only think we change when we're challenged. And that's my whole objective is to speak truth you know, truth in love, but also truth to power. 
and that power that's sort of coercive and manipulative. And I'm just, I'm done with the Dr. Bach. I'm like, I'm done with that sort of religious way of conversion. I want Jesus's way of transformation. Right. So what do you think, if we don't come out and talk about this today, where do you think Christianity, as we've grown up with, a more traditional fundamentalist Christianity, where do you think it's headed? It's, it's going to die on the vine. It's going to die on its own vine. So tell me about the email. Yeah. I just got. So, you know, before coming in to shoot, um, we, we got an email from a guy who's been visiting a couple of weeks, came for this particular series, and was invited by, you know, one of our, our typical, you know, our, our Sun Coaster has been a part of this community forever. And he had given up on church, and he was pretty adamant to his friend, like, hey, I'm glad you found a church that you love, but I'm just not going to church. Like, church has hurt me. One of his sons had come out as being gay, and um, there was some some pain that was enveloped there through the traditional religious orthodox teaching of you know, fundamental Christianity. And Jay was just like, you have to come check this out. All right. This new series is really going to challenge those old ways of thinking and he came and he loved it and he felt that freedom that man god does love me god loves my son there's no condemnation in us being who we are and when you read an email like that it just man it just makes you feel like if 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 that one person it was worth it for just that one to experience the true love and the nature of what God is and how God works in the world. And so I forwarded it to to all, all of our leadership team and said, hey, this is why we do what we do. Because we can, we can forget sometimes. We get lost in the, you know, because we have pretty set schedules in what we do when we film and what we're doing. And, and we can get lost in the monotony of church work and forget <laughs> that we are the church, like we right. are the called out ones. And everything we do is for that singular purpose, to challenge people so that they they are in that transformational mode of becoming more like Christ every day. And, and creating an environment where people can say, I'm not offended by this. Yes. This makes sense. And sometimes logic or common sense, not too common anymore. How would you respond to this comment? This is years ago before yep. you got here. The guy that was a youth pastor, I was talking to him, he goes, I go, but you know, you know, as a father loves a son, you love your son. And he said, yes, and my son is going straight to hell mm. because he is not doing what he should be doing, and he's going straight to hell. And this is a youth pastor, and his son is kind of a bright guy, you know, in dialogue with my son. They're having a pretty good conversation, but his dad was like, nope, yeah, to hell you go. How, how What damage do you think that does to, to other people when we talk like that? It's it's It does almost irreparable damage to our, our mind, to, to how we feel about ourselves, And cause again, I, I don't know the guy or his son, but I would assume his son's not a bad kid by any Correct. stretch, probably disagrees with his dad on certain theology, which is all speculative anyway. Um, but you know, Nietzsche said it the best. He says, sometimes, um, the, the the best people in the world have all the doubts mm -hmm. and the worst people in the world have all the certainty. Yeah. And that's just not how our community is fixed. It's okay to have doubts. The enemy of faith is not doubt. Right. The enemy of faith is certainty. Right. That is the absolute opposite. And and that's where that's how I'd respond to that dad like you know, most people want to hold to that view of eternal conscious torment because they've been hurt and there's somebody that they want there. Right. And I'm like, let it go. Yeah. Let it go. But can you imagine? So if that young adult now who's the son of this dad were to come to Suncoast, he might find a whole different perspective and possibly a place to be in community. Because yes. the teaching here is so different than that. Absolutely. So uh, so if a young guy came in like that and said, well, this is my, my dad said, what would you say to him? Oh, I'd say, I, I disagree with your dad, but here's why. Yeah. And I would lay it out for him. Um, it's, it's, it's like I said, we just had that conversation. Beware the sound of one hand clapping. 
Dr. Green told me that at Oxford. Beware the sound of one hand clapping. And I would show him there's another way to look at this. There's another way to look at this. I think we change based on two things. Our perspective can change. Mm -hmm. That's through education and losing the ignorance of a particular topic or subject. But also by proximity. I think proximity gives us the ability to change. When, when I may have a certain belief about, say, homosexuality, but then my son comes out as gay. Now I'm, it's not only perspective, it's proximity. Right. I'm, I am close to this situation. And those are the things I think God gives us to change our mind. And um, perspective is great, but man, proximity is the greatest. And anytime I see people lose the opportunity to change their mind, in particular about a son who has a different idea about God than his dad, then that's proximity. Now, dad needs to do a little bit of research. And so that's that's how I would I would tell him. I would lay it out like here's the other side of that argument, man, and you're good. Yeah, I, and I think the dad may, you know, I would challenge his look at your concept of who God is. Yes, somewhere you've lost the loving heavenly Father. Yeah, and there's a punitive uh, deity that's angry and he's out to get you unless you do this specific thing, and you refuted that very well this weekend. So yeah. I'm just I want to say publicly I'm glad you're on our team. Uh, we just came out of a big, oh, an hour plus staff meeting with all the staff after yeah. Escape the Woods, and and I just marvel at the the creativity, the 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 lack of toxicity, the yeah. fact that we really are kind of like a family within the within our community, yeah. But also the all inclusive nature of it, of seeing what people are doing in a variety of ways and realizing that God's kingdom is made up of a lot of different types. And, That's right. Uh, but we have the opportunity to lead them on the weekend yeah. and lead them on Sunday. And you just came off of four weeks teaching. And I just I just want to say, well done. Thank you for being a part of this team. Thank That's you for communicating to, to our community these great truths. And I was so proud. And, uh, I'm glad. and I'm always glad when you get up to teach and, uh, yeah. and I get the opportunity to come back this weekend and then you get to be on again and then yeah. maybe we'll do some tag team stuff, but it's, it's a lot of fun. So for those of you watching, thank you for tuning into one more thing. Thank yeah. you for watching on the weekend. And if you haven't watched each of these fearless teachings, I suggest go back and watch all four of them because yeah. they are well done. That's coming from me. I didn't teach them. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot easier for me to say, go back and watch Troy do an excellent job. than go back and watch me be great. Yeah, yeah. There's a lack of humility there, but I think these are wonderful teachings and it'll help you. Thank and you. if you need, if someone who's watching this, if you know someone who's struggling with the issues of church and concept of God, they can go back and watch these. I think these will come become part of our history and formative teachings for our yeah. community, for not just for now, but also as a library and a resource for yeah. the future. Absolutely. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks, Dr. Bachman. My pleasure.